You are listening to Rootbound, a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. Rootbound is brought to you by winter. Look around, leaves are brown, and the sky is a hazy shade of winter. Yes, this is the winter special episode of Rootbound, the episode where we talk about winter and plants in general. And unlike the rest of the seasons, winter is kind of a weird one because plants are not doing as much in winter. And and at first glance, it may not really seem like much is going on, but there is a lot going on, and you'll hear that later in the show. Um, I think the other thing that winter is like for gardeners like me uh, is it's, it's kind of a time of impatience. You know, you're you're waiting for the spring so you can actually like get out there and do more stuff with your plants. And it's often a time uh, for kind of amateur gardeners like me where you maybe get ahead of yourself and start your seedlings a little too soon in anticipation for the spring. And then you end up with these very leggy seedlings that maybe aren't really ready for the spring. This year, I'm going to try to like hold off on my seed planting. It's always that balance of like, do you start too early or do you start too late? That's what winter is, I think, for me when you're gardening uh, with the indoor stuff, at least in this part of the country. Um, But yes, uh, we're going to talk to a few different people. That's something different that happens on these special season episodes. We have more than one guest. We talk about the plant in general uh, and the season in general. And before we get to that, just I, I couldn't remember a word you'll hear later. And that word, which has to do with the uh, measuring of time using natural phenomenon, is phenology. I talked about it in a previous episode. The word escaped me when I was talking with our friends, uh, but that's the word, phonology, and you'll know it when I start talking about it later in the episode. So enjoy this special winter episode of Rootbound. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the winter special episode of Rootbound. If you've been listening for a while, you know that we do special episodes for each season, and this is the winter episode, and these episodes are a little bit different. Instead of having one guest share one plant that means something to them, and I share a plant that means something to me, we have a few guests, and we talk about the season and plants in general, and today we are joined, as always, on these special episodes by my wife, Carla. Hello. And also, you'll remember from both the episode about mangroves and the spring episode, we have... Anwesha. Hi, and then also perhaps chiming in who you might remember talking about mosquitoes on the summer episode is Trin. Hey, how are you? Um, So yeah, we're going to have a little conversation about winter and plants. And um, just to kick us off, we are all now drinking what is maybe the quintessential plant-based winter beverage, which is hot chocolate. Yeah. And it's very tasty. I looked up a recipe, which I put in show notes, which is basically like chop up a bunch of chocolate bars and melt them (laughs) in milk and just doing it slowly. Oh, I I forgot. I forgot to mention we have another special guest here who is Muggsy the Small Terrier. Muggsy, do you have anything to say? (laughs) He's a quiet dog, but he has a jingly collar. And you might hear his little pitter-patters around. Uh, uh, It'll be a, a little bit of a theater for the mind, hearing his little feet click around the floor here. Um... But yes, hot chocolate is, is, is perhaps, you know, the quintessential winter beverage. But interestingly, and I think most of us know this, the chocolate plant is a tropical plant. Right. And hot chocolate mm. itself was invented by the Mayans in this tropical place. And it was a very different beverage. I mean, Carly, you might have some knowledge of that. Oh, sure. I mean, it was fermented um, way back in the day. And um, I think it was more of a an alcoholic e sli- slightly alcoholic beverage it wasn't like i guess like super alcoholic but i didn't do any research on no, that no that's okay i wasn't expecting that from my understanding it was also more spicy and bitter it wasn't really sweet yes. very much at right. all um but you know when europeans uh came over and and uh, found out how awesome chocolate was it kind of took over the world and now chocolate is so many things and it's so interesting that this very tropical fruit has become like a beverage that we all think about with sitting in the snow, like at a Very at true. a chalet. Um, so anyway, that that was that's the first little uh, chocolate, our first little winter fact I have to share. And then just quickly before we kind of move on to other people's uh, winter things, I just want to go. I just want to acknowledge how how kind of present plants are in the winter tradition of Christmas, which is very interesting. Right. Um, so just three quick facts, and maybe other people have some things to say about these, but one is that, uh, 
the reason why the colors for Christmas are, are green and red is because of the holly tree. So holly was used in many of uh, pre-Christianity. There's a, there's a holiday called Saturnalia, which is what Christmas kind of lined up with, the pagan holiday. And holly branches were used in those traditions. And because holly is an evergreen tree and the berries are blooming and the, the berries stay all winter long, it was this kind of symbol of life in the dead of winter. And it was used in, you know, deck the halls of bow, with boughs of holly. So the red and green of holly became the Christmas colors, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Mm. Second, the reason why mistletoe is associated with Christmas, and there's the, why you kiss people under mistletoe is more complicated and not necessarily winter, winter wise. But the reason why uh, mistletoe is associated with winter is because uh, mistletoe is a parasitic plant. It it lives on other trees, and it is evergreen. Those a lot of the trees it lives on are not. So in the winter, when all the leaves fall off the tree, you have these clumps of green left in these dead trees. And so it was also a symbol of like life and a sign of like not everything is dead, even though it's a parasite, which I think people didn't know back then. Um, and then the third one, which I thought was very interesting, is we think about poinsettias as being a very Christmas flower. But poinsettias, like chocolate, are also originally from Mexico, which is quite interesting. Um, and the reason they became associated with Christmas is because in Mexico, they bloom around Christmas time. So, and they have this green and red color, like the holly. And so also there's some talk that they, uh, that they also kind of look like the Star of Bethlehem. Um, but basically, I think people, Europeans who came and were in Mexico were like, oh, we need another red and green thing. These yeah. things are really cool. They look Christmassy. And so now it is spread as a Christmas thing. So anyway, that's my, my Christmas chat. Who else has something to say about winter and plants? Um, I was actually about to jump in with a poinsettia oh, as, as oh, you were starting. Oh, I stole it. No, 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 I'm sorry. No, no. no as you, I, it wasn't even something I had planned. It was just as you were talking about the holly, I was like, oh, well, in Mexico we have the poinsettia, even though, of course, its origins are completely unrelated to any Christian tradition, um, as you might imagine. But yeah, so I was just, I was going to jump in with that. But you covered everything that, yeah. Yeah, and they, they do apparently have some, like, you Medicinal know, properties. Medicinal properties yeah. and, like, some importance in, I think, uh, you know, various indigenous Mexican cultures too. Yes, that's right. And they are they are winter blooming plants. The winter in Mexico is a bit different from what we, at least in this part of the country and world, imagine as winter. But yeah, that's true. Even though uh, Mexico City is, although it's like um, further south, it's also, if you recall, really high up, like altitude wise. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, it's not as as tropical as people would imagine. It's very, yeah, true. it's very temperate. True. Um, interesting. Yeah. Well. Yeah. What else do you have? Uh, uh, any notes or are here? Yeah. Like here on Wisha. Um, I was just going to chime in on on the Christmas theme as well with um, Christmas trees, which oh, you yes. didn't cover, yes. um, but perhaps like the most mm -hmm. iconic thing about Christmas. And I just find it interesting. Well, obviously it's evergreen, and that's why I, I imagine that's why it was chosen as the you know symbol for Christmas. But also, I just think it's interesting that it's a tree that's grown just for, you know, people to buy during one season to, to, de to decorate. Um, so many other, obviously most plants are, you know, farmed for food. And then there are some that are farmed as like house plants or, or outdoor plants that are around year round. But these are trees that are literally just farmed to cut down and keep in a house for a season. And, you know, I did a little bit of research and I found out that Christmas trees of marketable height of around like seven to eight feet take about 15 years to grow. So imagine that the tree that you're buying for Christmas was planted, you know, by a farmer 15 years ago. And, and Christmas tree farms apparently, you know, run in families. So sometimes, you know, maybe one generation planted the tree and another generation is going to be the one, you know, harvesting them and selling them on the market, which is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, that that is pretty interesting. And I, I guess I, there might be um, oh, oh Mugsy, Mugs. Mugsy. Right. come here, Mugsy. <laughs> um, I think I'm. I, I, there probably are multiple species that are used as Christmas trees. I think spruce is maybe the original, most common one. Um, but, but it is an interesting thing that we, we like have a holiday that's just based off of cutting down trees and not <laughs> using them later. And, you know, those trees are also good timber species, right? So you, they could be used. Um, and I don't, I didn't do this research. I don't know, know if you did the origin of the holiday, why we started bringing tree, trees oh, indoors, wow. but audience, you can Google that. So <laughs> yeah. Carla, do you have any winter uh, things to share with us? Yeah. So I was actually 
looking up the concept of vernalization, uh, mm. which is, um, and because I, specif um, I specifically remember, you know, like garlic and um, onion all kind of require a period of cold. Um, and so that is the whole vernalization process um, in order to grow the, the bulb and that's tasty and that we can use. But uh, I also found some interesting facts uh, from a couple of different papers that um, even though that period of vernalization, that frost requirement for um, onions and garlic and things like that to grow, um, it, it's, um, it's required for the bulb, but it also causes bolting in the spring. And so it's like kind of like a, um, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. They might bolt faster depending on how cold things get, mm. uh, which is kind of like you're racing against time because you don't want things to bolt. You, you want to use the, you want to use the bulb. Mm -hmm. So it's just mm -hmm. kind of interesting that both would happen um, based on the frost. That's really cycle. interesting. Now this mm -hmm. word vernalization, I don't know if you have the definition there, because I also did something, a research on the concept of winter dormancy, which sounds, f well, related, not the same, but related. Um, you know, and that's, you know, it's pretty obvious plants mm. become dormant, at least if you're in a place that has a, a harsh winter, plants become dormant in the winter. And actually, even in places that don't get too cold, sometimes there is a period of dormancy around winter. Mm. Um, but that, the, the, the fun facts I found about dormancy, the, the main one is that, is that uh, during that time, the plants not only get dormant, but they also essentially create antifreeze. They oh. they uh, yeah. they saturate the water that is in them with sugars and and salts and other compounds mm -hmm. to lower the freezing point of the water in their tissues so they do not die of, of frostbite which mm -hmm. is pretty fascinating. That is interesting. Uh, and that process also, um, you know, those those chemicals are 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 ready and available when it warms up, which is pretty fascinating. Um, yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool that plants make that make their own antifreeze. That is, that is cool. Um, and Must just be. to answer. <laughs> Just <laughs> it's okay. Mugsy, come here, buddy. Come here. You're a very good guard dog. Mugsy, come here. Good or a welcome dog. There he is. Um, well, to answer your question, uh, vernalization. Uh, so yeah, to answer your question, I did look up what vernalization means. Um, it comes from the Latin vernus of the spring, and it is the induction of a plant's flowering process by exposure to the prolonged cold of winter or by an artificial equivalent. Say that one more time. Uh, vernalization from the Latin vernus, which means of the spring, is the induction of a plant's flowering process by exposure to the prolonged cold of winter or by an artificial equivalent. So you can, you know, throw a plant in the freezer. Interesting, that is super fascinating. Um, I, I was reading similar to dormancy, and it sounds like it's a very similar process of certain yeah. plants need these periods, these, these chill, uh, the article I read was calling things chilling hours. To come out of dormancy, plants need, uh, and some people think it was specific days that are below freezing, but that's, the count, that's not what it is. The plants are counting a certain number of days slightly above freezing, but not too warm. Mm -hmm. So if it, so that's what they're looking for to kind of come out of dormancy is a certain number of these chilling days mm -hmm. where it's coming out. And the one really fascinating uh, thing I read on the Wikipedia is that if you simulate an everlasting summer, so they an example of a Japanese maple where they had it indoors under lights, always warm, um, it, it, you can prolong its summer phase and they were able to do it for like two years. But after that, it went dormant anyway. Huh. So... The, the plants aren't just doing dormancy for like because winter is coming they also kind of need it as a period of rest and so and if you and if you um so you're saying plants also need sleep yeah yeah and apparently if you never give if like if you never give the plant an actual winter period the the death rate is 100 percent. like they cannot survive certain plants that plants that do have a winter cycle not all plants do that but plants that do have a winter cycle if you put them in a situation where there is only summer conditions, they will go into dormancy, but when they wake back up again, they're not going to be in good shape, and eventually they will die, which is, so the plants need that sleep, at least so those certain plants. Pretty much the experiment they conducted was like, 
Sleep deprivation torture? Yeah, it does sound bad when you really think about it. But, oh my gosh, that's but, awful. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's something to learn from plants, and we all need sleep, even, yeah. even the sleepy trees. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Anyone else have anything here? Um, I was just going to chime in on a couple of things you, you both mentioned. Um, garlic, well, I experimented with growing uh, garlic, and I've also experimented with growing grapes. Um, and I live in the Northeast, and so it gets cold. But actually, fun fact, because I'm in a smaller space in a big city, I keep my garlic in the fridge, which I know you're not supposed to do, but that's kind of how I found out about the vernalization because it started sprouting, and I looked it up, and it said, you know, garlic needs cold hours, and so if you keep it in the fridge, it's going to start sprouting, and that gave me the idea to start planting it. So if you if you want to try uh, growing garlic in a region where you don't have a cold period or, you, you know, you don't have ground space to put your garlic out, you can try putting it in the fridge and then planting it. Um, and what actually... I think the cold is also required for the segmentation of the garlic. Mm. So when I tried this, um, I'm not sure my fridge was maybe cold enough. I, I'm not. I'm not sure because I didn't put it in the freezer, obviously. Um, so what happened is I got garlic bulbs, but they were not segmented. They were sort of large garlic bulbs, which is apparently called spring garlic in some places. So um, still tasty, a little bit milder. Um, but yeah, I think it needed more cold periods um, for it to set, turn into like a garlic bulb with the different cloves that we imagine. Um, the other thing I was going to say was um, about, uh, Carla, what were you talking about again? Grapes. Oh, sorry. I thought about this because I was trying to grow grapes and grapes also need a certain amount of chill hours. So, you know, as we know, most of us who like wine probably have, you know, wanted to or gone to a, a vineyard before. And usually those are in places that get significant, significant amounts of cold. Um, and that's because the grapes actually have dormancy and then they have a bud break process when the sap starts flowing through the vines again. And you'll notice, you know, in vineyards, there's little sort of little buds popping out of the of, of the vines and farmers actually cut back grape vines quite significantly each year. So when we see a, a, a grape a vineyard in the summertime it looks like, you know, miles and miles of just green, but actually it's cut back to just a couple of feet beyond the stock in the winter or sorry, right before winter and then freezes over in the winter and all of that greenery regrows every single year um, after winter's over, after the dormancy. Um, and then one last thing, I'm from Florida, and an interesting thing about, you know, obviously Florida is not super cold. However, it does get cold enough there to affect some of the produce that Florida is known for, like oranges. And so once I remember I was in an orange grove doing sort of a tour, and they told us that they spray the orange trees with water, actually, when it gets really cold, which we thought was kind of interesting and sounded counterintuitive. But what actually happens is the water freezes around each orange into sort of like a protective sheath. Mm -hmm. um, and because that ice stays at around 32 degrees, mm -hmm. it actually protects the orange inside from getting colder than that. Which so when it went, you know, especially this winter in Florida, we had a pretty cold period. It went down even into the upper 20s, which is sort of unheard of for Florida. So that's how they protect the oranges, which are sort of tropical plants. That's really cool. Yeah, I super didn't realize fascinating. that. I, I was thinking, there's so many things to talk about with that. One, it is interesting that oranges, I think, at least, at least in Europe, but that, that has like kind of came into the United States. Oranges are kind of a Christmas fruit too. Oh, no. I don't know if you've ever gotten like that's a thing in Europe for sure. Like you give kids oranges or other like citrus fruits. Tangerines. Tangerines. The clement yeah. yeah. And and that's because I think oranges are such a hearty fruit and they ship well and you can ship them from a warmer place up into, you know, uh, the mountains of, of, of Germany and give them to kids and it's a bright spot in the cold of it's winter. A, the, well, in Switzerland, at least it's the... And Sammy, Sammy Claus, oh, yeah. tag, like the Santa Claus. Day. Santa Claus brings Santa uh, Claus oranges. Santa Claus brings the oranges and, and peanuts, right? Oh, yeah. Some other, or yeah. maybe wal walnuts, maybe? or Maybe, yeah. Anyway. Um, I could just be mixing that with a Mexican tradition as well. Which one happens? Uh, in Christmas, you know, like around Christmas time, right before Christmas, there's the posadas in Mexico. And then you have, um, like, it's like a, like a, you know, cultural, but yet also religious Catholic thing but at the end you have the piñatas and you fill them up and you fill them up with fruit and some mm. of those fruits are like citrus but also um, peanuts 
and like other other they're not like sweets sweets traditionally they're like sweet fruits hmm. or snacks like natural snacks that sounds fun yeah i know we should yeah, we, we should, should do that yeah we should <laughs> um Okay, other things that you mentioned, Anwesha, uh, that is, is the garlic is really interesting. I've grown garlic a few times. I didn't this year because I totally forgot. But garlic is a weird one because you, if you want to grow garlic, you plant it in the fall. And then it actually starts to sprout in the winter a little bit, and then it really comes in in the spring. Um, but what makes that interesting is that um, we treat garlic as an annual, but garlic is actually perennial. And so the reason why, and that one of the, the reason why you can kind of tell that the reason you plant it in the fall is because it actually needs more time than most plants to get to harvesting phase because it's not an annual. You can't plant it in the spring and harvest it in the, in the fall. It needs that fall all the way to the summer really to get harvested. Um, but if you leave garlic bulbs in the ground, those bulbs will split. You know, all the cloves will split and each one of those will grow a new plant and they spread out. And you can actually, and I tried that one year or over a couple of years where I left one in and then only harvested from the edge to just take you know new cloves at the time and it worked and then I don't know why that plant ended up uh, not going after two years but apparently you can continuously harvest garlic and treat it as a as an as a perennial which is pretty cool. I think uh, um, it depends on the variety. Some of them can keep going a longer time, yeah. but after some time, certain like certain varieties just stop producing after a couple of years. That so, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then when it comes to grapes, we have a grape at our house, which is, a, I talked about an episode a while back, which is a muscadine grape. It's a native grape to North America. It's a very hardy grape. It is uh, also known as the southern grape. It grows really far in the south. It's much more humidity, humidity tolerant than the European grape. Um, but one thing I noticed last year is that I had, I had trimmed it in a few places, and you mentioned the sap flow is in the spring. It actually started dripping and, and apparently you can collect that sap like you can collect sap from like a, a, a maple tree. Um, I think it's not quite as full of sugar, so you, you probably are not going to get a syrup, but you could like drink it. I guess it's a, actually a survival source of water from a place where it's a really dry winter. Theoretically, you can harvest water from wild grapes. Um, so that's cool. I'm going to try that this year because I do have to trim our grape back. It has grown quite a bit. And so, yes. Uh, well, since you mentioned sap... Yeah. Um, recently, I've just been kind of ex- been exposed to the concept of trying to uh, not measure time in like the way that humans do usually, which is like, oh, it's like January, February, like, and I have these things that I have to do as a human living in modern society, but trying to measure things um, like and enjoy things time wise as a, you know, based on the natural world and what you look forward to. Um, and one of the things that I look forward to the most in winter is um, the maple sap collection. And I remember um, last year I was working like one does, and I looked up <laughs> and I saw uh, a woodpecker um, on our maple tree, and it didn't look like it was pecking the the maple for insects to eat so much as it looked like it was pecking it to drink the sap. And that's when we knew that the maple sap was flowing, which I thought was very cool. And I'm looking forward to that. And as I mentioned on the maple episode, I have been uh, making syrup from a maple tree Mm -hmm. for the last three years now, I think. And it is a winter activity. It's normally in February because you need to have temperatures below freezing. Once I've collected enough sap, I stand outside for a whole day uh, (laughs) over the wood fire and uh, boil down the sap. And I go from normally about three gallons of sap to about eight ounces of syrup. So it's, it's kind of a fun activity, even though it's, you know, if you don't have like a tons of sugar maple trees, you can't really get a lot of syrup, but it is kind of fun. And then we also like to make coffee with the sap, which is really fun. That is the best. I was just trying to look up. There's a word that I talked about um, in one of the episodes and I'm blanking on it, that is the, is the like study of use of natural processes for keeping time. Mm-hmm. And now I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, like no, it's more like plants and animals, like how the behavior of plants and animals and also like geological processes of, of for keeping time. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, I'm sorry, audience, you can Google it or I'll talk about it later. <laughs> I'm totally blanking on it, but I, I talked about it. I found the episode. I just didn't, it was back on episode, um, 31 is when I talked about it, of, of using yeah. plants and also animals and stuff as indicators of time, which is really interesting. And the bird that we saw, it was in the woodpecker-like family, but it was a yellow-bellied sapsucker. So very, 
Oh, how apropos. <laughs> Very appropriate, yes. <laughs> Um, also, I, one of the other things I enjoy about the winter is seeing like the foxes kind of run around the garden. Yeah, they. they it's not plant related, no, but well, I they're, do they're, enjoy that. They're hunting for mice or other animals that Which are eating I appreciate. plants. Yes, I appreciate them hunting mice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, foxes. <laughs> this is maybe not exactly winter related, but it does it does count. Like you know, we're having hot chocolate, which is chocolate, but it's also milk, and that's not a plant. But milk is essentially plant juice made by cows. And if you really do think about it, like all the food we eat is, well, all the food, ultimately yeah. the source of all the food we eat is solar power, yeah. right? Yeah. But the plants are the things that can turn the solar power into food. And then other things eat those and turn it into food. So like one of the cool things about this podcast talking about plants is it is so fundamental. Like mm -hmm. there's like, I think the only exception, maybe some good thing about this is like there are some, some creatures that live at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Muggsy's being a ham over there. Hi, buddy. Hi. Um, some of the plants that live at the very bottom of the ocean near thermal vents, their energy comes from, like, uh, you know, the, the core of the earth. But I think basically everything else uh, is eventually is really solar power, which, you know, you've got to have a photosynthesizing creature to get that energy out of the out of the sun. So that's why plants are so cool. And even in the winter... They've stored that energy underground, which is super cool. And so I talked about in one episode all the different energy storage organs. Plants have different methods for storing it. And roots are, are those, like, simply roots. Like, trees don't have anything, like, like specific. They have just big roots that store the energy. But uh, bulbs and tubers and corms are all these different uh, biological features that store that energy of the sun underground, ready for uh, the springtime. So that's pretty cool and they're very efficient and then some of those are very tasty as well mm -hmm. true anyone else have any uh, winter fun facts or doesn't trend you have nothing i try looking at some festivus related stuff but they don't use new plants no 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 <laughs> no um well i think well that will wrap up the winter special episode of rootbound thank you for listening and um I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to do another spring episode. We've done all four seasons now on Rootbound, and we've been over a year of, of, of podcasts. I'm trying to think how I'm going to make the next spring episode different. So tune in for that. We'll see how I do, that happens in the spring. But uh, there'll be another episode of, of uh, Rootbound with just a couple plants next week. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, Muggsy. <laughs>